uh, quick call um, today. So one, so <clears throat> now I've sort of lost touch with the um, Trump assassination conspiracy discussion, so so to speak. Um, and you have basically conditioned me out of even considering a conspiracy, right? Yes. And, <laughs> and now, so just for my own information, if you would you mind disclosing on a scale of one to ten, right? For zero being there being no conspiracy, and ten being there's definitely a conspiracy. Where are you vis a vis I, the conspiracy hypothesis? I guess emotionally, I'm a five. Uh, rationally, cognitively, I got to be a two. Okay. Because, you know, in the past, I've been a bit more conspiracy minding, minded than you have been. Yes. And, you know, you know, not to bring up old painful memories, but the whole, our whole COVID discussions and so forth. Not that we need to re-enter those. But, um, yeah, but on this one, I, I'm really on strongly on the side of incompetence rather than conspiracy. And only because I don't understand operationally how it would work that um, this Secret Service detail would have been told to and then therefore implemented a plan to allow a you know, an assassin to be successful. Like, how would that work in practical terms? I just can't get my mind around it. Yeah, so how I was thinking, I, I never thought that there was, like, active cooperation between the Biden administration and Thomas Crooks. N no one would hire Thomas Crooks to carry out an assassination. What I thought w was that it looked like maliciousness on the part of the Biden administration to simply not provide Donald Trump with adequate or competent security. So... Just as Donald Trump did not provide Joe Biden with adequate security, the security that he was entitled to after he won the election, it would not have surprised me if the, the Biden administration had turned around and uh, chosen to deploy its most competent assets elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, so I, I never no. thought that uh, someone on top was uh, telling, issuing orders to don't do your job, right? I, I don't think that there would be any obvious tells. It, it was more uh, just uh, using, using the, the most competent assets elsewhere and just uh, allowing Trump security to be the dregs of the available options, opening up yeah. space for things like this. Okay, here's, I, I realize for all of the incompetence that we've identified with the Secret Service, we're talking about a time window of eight seconds, are we not? Well, it depends on how you, you frame it. So was, it, was there eight or 16 seconds between the first shot on Donald Trump and when the guy eventually gets killed? Yeah, something in the neighborhood of eight to uh, 20 seconds. But the window, depending on how you frame it, it could be three hours three hours was when the first law enforcement report was that we had a highly suspicious character walking around with a rangeometer. Yeah, no, I, I exactly. Now, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm taking no position because um, I've been in sort of situations where it required, it was a sort of semi-emergency situation and I'm sort of aware of the mind state that goes on when you're in a semi-emergency and like how clouded and murky your thinking becomes and such a thing. Because if you don't know exactly what to do, your instinct is to freeze, you know? Yeah. Yes. And so I have a lot Particularly of... Particularly the less competent you are, right? The more competent you are, you are so trained. You got, you got so much muscle memory, you're less likely to freeze. But if this is new and apparently... This was an event staffed by a lot of Department of Homeland Security people who weren't really competent in the area of protection instead of uh, Secret Service agents who are trained. Go ahead. Yeah, well, you're right. And um, put it this way, I'm way on the side of incompetence or poor training or, uh, you know, just snafu, whatever. I, I think... 
people aren't machines, right? And so I think the general public or somebody observing from the outside just assumes that people are machines, they're perfectly trained and whatever happens, they immediately lurch to the right conclusion and take the correct action. And they're not. People have good days and they have bad days, teams. Like who on the ground was capable, you know, I, I know nothing about any of this, but eventually, like, are the snipers empowered to take this action on their own? Yes, uh, uh, I, I believe they are. Yes, they can take out anyone they see as a as a threat. Yeah, I just can't fault them for having doubts or waiting for a little bit more confirmation. Yeah, I just, it's just hard for me to, as much as I'd like to, believe me, you know, I'm sympathetic to... Those, right-wing outrage yeah. yeah you're on the right yeah. you're, you're sympathetic to right-wing outrage this is yeah the biden administration is responsible for donald trump's uh, security yeah but at the same time i can understand being in the position not that i can really understand being in the position of being a sniper but i can understand a little bit of hesitation just to double check and double check before taking like the very you know, moral consequential action of taking a human life. You want to be ultra sure. That would at least be if I were by some bizarre twist of fate in that sniper's shoes, it would be so hard for me to like make the correct decision. And I, I could totally understand and empathize with freezing at that point. Now, yes. Now, I'm just trying to be balanced. I'm trying to be objective. I'm trying no, I to... appreciate it because this is the the one time where I'm more on the conspiratorial angle, meaning uh, a degree of recklessness and callousness on the part of uh, those who provide security at, at a certain point becomes malicious. Yeah, I mean, you know, case in point, you know, Derek Chauvin, George Floyd, you know, there is so much precedent to err on the side of inaction rather than action and um i can totally understand why people would be just a little bit deliberate more deliberative than they should have been and i I just feel for everybody involved you know um ultimately it worked out for the best you know quote unquote um but uh, yeah, I just, it's just so hard for me to grapple with the situation where people are in circumstances that I, I just try to put myself in the shoes of the people responsible for acting. Yeah. And I'm thinking, would I be actually, would I be, I could easily been that guy that just dawdles. I could easily have been that guy. I'm just being honest. With yeah. Myself. Yeah. No, we, we've all been that guy. Like uh, not many people embody excellence and, to the extent that we have consistently embodied excellence as being within a, a particular domain. Yeah. A narrow domain. A certain situation where yeah. we tend to be excellent. Yeah. So this is why this story has been so hard for me to like uh, grapple with. And I've just elected not to. And I've gone on to more, you know, easy and more risible and more entertaining stories such as Kamala, you know. Um, but I, it's, I, I'm, imp- I'm impressed with your, your ability to persist with this story. Cause, yeah, yeah, I'm obsessed with the, this story, uh, just the, the intellectual challenge of it. And, uh, and I do not like my company on the side of the conspiratorial angle. I do yeah, not like so, the people that I'm aligned with. Yeah, it's amusing to watch this. Um, yes. Cognitive you're <laughs> All right, so let's move from this topic. I have one more topic, another topic yes. to discuss. Okay, so have you noticed or observed this particular fetish to criticize and condemn people who mispronounce Kamala's name? Have you noticed? Yes, this? yes, and and I think I I, I side with Mark Halperin. I I think it is discourteous to deliberately mispronounce her name okay well we differ here because i don't necessarily think it's intentional you know and i don't think it's necessarily malicious and i think it's utterly bizarre 
that the entire media is sort of unified on this particular minutia about mispronouncing a name that is just really not native to the Anglosphere. So I can really forgive people who look at that name and not really know how to pronounce it perfectly. Right, but it's and, not malicious if you don't know how to pronounce it or if your, your lips don't move <clears throat> that way. Those who say it's malicious are only referring to those who deliberately mispronounce a name. They're, they're not referring to those who don't know better or they can't get their lips to form the proper sound. But even if it's close to me, it's acceptable. Like these names like Barack and Obama, these are not Anglosphere names, you know? And Kamala, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly right now no, or not. Kamala, yep. it's like Kama, Kamala, Kamala. Did I do it right or not? Not, not really. It's Kamala, okay. Kama, so Kama, I was not Kamala. intentionally being malicious. I was not intentionally <laughs> being malicious, but I could easily have been characterized as being malicious because I'm just looking at letters on a page and I'm just trying to sound them out and do my best, right? And I, and so I was, the reason I bring this up is because I was watching one of Mark Halpern's streams. Yes. And one of the callers in to Mark's show apparently had mispronounced Kamala's name. And then Mark was like utterly quick to like castigate him for mispronouncing the name. And to me, that I, I don't, as much as I like Halpern and all fours, He's not a neutral arbiter whatsoever, as much as he pretends to be. He is definitely all in on the anti-Trump side. You know, whether you like that or not, there's no mistaking that in my per my view. What do you think? I I don't think that's fair. Of course, he's not perfectly centrist. Yeah, I think he probably uh, leans a little bit more to the left. But I don't know anyone who does a a better job. Uh, doing what he does like he and, and what speaks well for him is that he gets experts from across the political spectrum who respect him and he has created a, a civil space for sophisticated conversation about american politics fair enough and i respect you know that what he's intending to do but if you really watch those streams and listen to those streams you're going to hear four to five people the basic it's basically a democratic party strategy yeah session. yeah most of the people on the streams are democrats yeah and he's clearly one of them you know and occasionally you know so i, I guess it's just, it's just this air of pseudo neutrality that bothers me about that stream you know as much as i like him i'm sure he's very personal and so forth but it really bothers me that I really feel like I'm in some sort of DNC strategy session and not a true. Well, some days you are. Most of the people idea. are DNC and they are. I mean, Democrats have dominated the news the last uh, three weeks. So I, I think you only started listening to Halperin in the last three weeks. And so the focus has been on the Democrats. Most of the commentators have been Democrats. What will the Democrats do is the you know, overwhelming focus. And I, I think he's been quite fair. He says this has been a, a massive cover up by the news media and by Joe Biden's aides to to cover up for his infirmity. Going back to 2018, right, it's Mark Halperin who says he saw clear signs of Joe Biden's cognitive decline back to uh, 2018. And he's been very caustic about Kamala Harris, about how she doesn't think well under the pressure, how she's a poor politician, that uh, she is a terrible manager. So I, I give him far more props than, than you do, e even though I recognize the primary focus has been the Democrats and most of the commentators are Democrats. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I, I still enjoy listening to the stream, but I, I don't go into it now thinking that I'm looking, I'm, a, I'm sort of like a neutral I'm a, I'm not in a neutral platform. I, I feel like um, maybe it's just that so many of his listeners are in fact Democrats. You know, and it, it's nothing to do with him. It's just the nature of his audience. But um, form for civilized. It's very funny when sophisticated I conversations. His dream, some length will go for that. Bipartisan and not angry or.
Sorry, go what ahead. Happens? I lost the last 20 seconds. Uh, technical malfunction on my end. Go ahead. Okay, so I don't know what you missed, but I'll just but say... The last 20 seconds, so... Okay, so I've been listening in on his streams, and my perception is that, A, it's sort of a democratic strategy session, but B, um, they've kind of... I, the, the, the depth to which... Uh, the Democratic side has drunk the DEI Kool-Aid is still astounding to me because they seem to think that the world and all of us and the rest of America are just crying out for this sort of peak DEI ticket, you know? <laughs> and that that's what we're all aching for and that we're just sort of suffering under this you know, totalitarian white supremacy. This is sort of the context with which most of the comments direct, you know, made to Marx seem to be coming from. And it's so alien from me because I just see the world so oppositely from that, if that's a word. Yeah, you're not, uh, you're not work. You have a, you have a different uh, hero system. And, and so that's, <laughs> that, that, that's why you see things the way you do. Yeah. So I'm so dying for you to just be on one of those calls of like, uh, <laughs> yeah. you just drop some like hero system, you know, red pills on those guys. <laughs> See how they go down. Anyway, I just some thoughts. You interested in Mark Hall Pern, so I associate him with you, and therefore I feel like I could, uh, you know, complain about him to you. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, Here's another topic. Yeah. Okay. So three or four months ago, you know, I was I paid my taxes and I was just looking at all my expenses. Now you sort of get really financially obsessed when you pay your taxes because you're finally forced to confront the reality yes. of your spending. Yes. That's, and so I was looking at it and I was looking at my Wi-Fi bill, my wife, my, my cell phone bill. And my cell mm -hmm. phone bill was like 120 bucks a month. Yeah, that's what I pay. I, I I don't think you seriously can do better than that. Well, you can, bro. You can. Ah. <laughs> but, there's, <laughs> but there's a cost. So I looked around. I'm saying, does everybody pay 120 bucks for a cell phone bill? You know, Pretty so much. And then I got this note. That I got this one of these ads. And the, uh, serendipitously, I got this one of these ads coming through on my email about this service. And they would give you... Uh, a cell phone. It was a very complicated set of plans, but at the end of the day, it was like one third the cost. So, like for forty bucks a month, you could effectively get the same thing as that you would get for one hundred and twenty bucks a month. And so, eighty bucks, eighty bucks times twelve, right, is basically a thousand dollars a year, right? Yeah. If you could save 80 bucks a month, you would effectively be making $1,000 just from yeah. spending less. And as my mother said, you know. Penny saved is a penny earned. But they, the government can't tax your, what you don't spend. They can't tax your savings. You know saying, okay, bro? so you're gonna switch to cricket? To... No, I switched. I not, not only <laughs> am I going to, I did switch. I did okay. switch it, right? And so, yeah. I went from like twelve hundred dollars a year for internet for cell phone to four hundred dollars a year, and I paid it in one lump sum. Okay. So, and it's basically work. But today, I went. You know, it's the summer. I went to the beach, and I'm. You know. 40 comes on, starts streaming, and I don't have connection. I don't have any. <laughs> you know? Everything else is fine. But when I go to the beach and I don't listen to 40, I can't hear 40. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I'm sitting there broiling and just ruminating and cursing myself for being, you know, penny wise and pound foolish for cheaping out effectively on my cell phone plan. Did you do an internet I, search for reviews on 
this product? Sort of ish, maybe. I don't exactly recall. But I just, the beach that I go to it happens to be a weird little dead spot. And like, it'll show up for like five minutes, and then there's like 10 minutes of downtime. Five minutes, and then 10 minutes of downtime. Do you know how infuriating that is? Oh, it drives me crazy. Yeah. And so, I just, and so this, this particular fact had uh, caused me to just like ruminate on all the times that I'd been penny wise and pound foolish. Yes. It's like, I have a cell phone. I want to stretch out. I want to get some sun. I want to relax. I want to listen to 40. I want to listen to streams, you know, and I don't want to deal with dead spots, you know? Yeah. 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 And absolutely. Absolutely. There, there are a lot of things that you don't want to take, you know, this out. Like if that worked, like more people would, would have the, the cheaper plan, but people by and large spend $120 a month for, for good reason. Yeah, and now I'm seeing it. So basically, I save 80 bucks a month, but I can't use the internet at the beach. And that wasn't in the fine print, bro. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that was my third topic. Final topic. So Curious Gazelle. You know yes. Curious Gazelle? Yes, I so did. She called, into, she called into your stream a number of times. Yes. And you two had like an extended conversation, right? Yep. And then she's kind of kind of drifted off into she's kind of drifted out and hasn't called in recently. Correct. And so so last night, you know, I'm looking at my phone and there's like this, you know, it's Twitter spaces, which yes. I'm gradually becoming more an aficionado of. Curious Gazelle has been streaming. And so I, I tuned in with no intention of calling in. I just tuned in because it was what was on the radio you know yeah and there's she has a number of characters she has a very peculiar uh delivery and demeanor that's actually kind of hypnotic and kind of interesting and uh, which i've yeah. come to enjoy yeah right yeah and, uh so i'm listening hour one hour two hours and then immediately then then she sees on the stream that i'm listening and then she just calls me out you know, invites me to join. Yeah. Like, oh my God, this is embarrassing. I wasn't really in the mood to like join a line stream right now. But same time, you know, someone's called me out. I feel duty bound to like call in. So I called in. I, I went on speaker, you know, I, I, I put, I unmuted my mic and I called in. And so we end up chatting. We end up chatting for like two hours. Wow. Right. <laughs> Which is bizarre, you know. Like I'm fading out. I'm fading out into sleep here. I'm just trying to listen to a stream before I go to bed, you know. And yeah. I, before you know it, I'm in like this long conversation with Curious Gazelle, you know. And then we start talking about you, you know, your stream. It's <laughs> <laughs> where you became the topic of conversation. And then we're talking back and forth, and why does Luke do what he does and so forth? And I offer my opinion, she offers hers, so on, and so forth. And um and so there had been maybe basically six people listening, right? When yeah. this whole conversation started. But by the end of it, it was just myself and her. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going on and on and on and just opining, you know, endlessly. And I'm like, oh, this is bizarre. <laughs> when I finally re so it's just very weird to have like a private conversation that's effective, that's public or a public pu conversation that's private you know because <laughs> there's only yeah two people yeah did she leave it up or did she delete it it's probably still up i suppose but you might uh, i'm scrolling you know, i'm scrolling not yeah. seeing it so it's just a weird sort of artifact of today's streaming culture that i can have a public conversation a two-way public conversation <laughs> <laughs> and it's just I was trying to, sort of, but anyway, I, I've encouraged her to uh, participate more because I do think she's an interesting voice because she yeah. has some very, um, she has some very, uh, what's the word, iconoclastic positions. She has some just a strange and very mercurial, uh, approach to events. Yes. And, and it was, it's just, it was a very fun conversation. So, Anyway, I just 
felt like I needed to tell you that. Okay, cool. Good to good to hear right. from you, man. All right, that's all I got, bro. All okay, right. take care, Bye -bye. bro. All right, bye. Cheers. All right, bye. All right, bye. So